democracy at work with another wolf response. This one about protests, Black Lives Matter, excessive police force, all of that. And I'm not going to repeat the many commentaries I'm sure you've heard, the videos you've seen, the conversations you're no doubt involved in. I'm going to try to connect what we've been seeing and thinking and talking about to capitalism, partly because other people don't look at it that way, and partly because I don't think these problems are solvable unless we have a change of system. They're built into capitalism. They always were. And we sooner or later have to face that if we want to solve those problems, social change beyond capitalism is where we ought to be looking. So let's begin. Capitalism has promised to bring great things to the human race. From its beginnings, in the French Revolution, the people who wanted to end feudalism and bring in capitalism said it would bring liberty, equality, and fraternity. Americans thought that too. If they revolted against British feudalism, King George III, we would have, you know, like it says in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and democracy, a system in which everybody who's affected by a decision has the right to participate equally in making it. Capitalism promised a lot, but on most of the really important things, liberty, equality, brotherhood, democracy, it didn't work out. The promises were broken. The goods were not delivered. We don't have equality. Not when Jeffrey Bezos has $160 billion and Los Angeles County in California last week announced that 66,000 people are living homeless on its streets. No, we don't have brotherhood. We've had a lot of examples about people not treating each other kindly, let alone in a brotherly way. Liberty? What? We can't even go out of our homes, most of us. 42 million of us have, taken, have had our jobs taken away from us. That doesn't give you more liberty. It gives you less. Nor is this the only time that we have been visited by illnesses, by failures of the government. Come on. We are the richest country in the world, or one of them. We have a great medical establishment. It tells us that all the time. And yet here's a robust fact for you to struggle with. The United States has 5% of the world's people. It has 30% of the world's deaths from the coronavirus. System failure. The doctors are there. The medicine is there, the tests, the ventilators, the masks. We can get them or we can produce them. But we didn't. And so we didn't have them. We still don't have them. Not adequately. And not as good as many other countries with fewer resources and less in the way of a medical establishment. Our system is the problem. So let's see a little bit deeper into this systemic analysis. With the kinds of inequality we have, 600 billionaires in America together have more wealth than the bottom half of the population. Guess what? People get bitter about it. They get envious about it. They get all the feelings you can imagine and understand about being close to, but held back from, enough money to furnish your home, feed your family, educate your children. So what happens if a tiny number of people have enormous wealth and power and vast numbers of people don't? And vast numbers of people have so little in the wealth of in the way of wealth and power that they're really living paycheck to paycheck, always on the edge, always worried always in difficulty. Well, if you have a society divided in that way, 
You need to enforce the peace, don't you? Because you know, as everyone else does, that a society broken apart into extremes of rich and poor is a society riven with conflict, always worried, the mass of people about their poverty, the rich about the fact that they're vulnerable because they're a minority. They're very small in number, and the numbers are all in the poor and the middle, and they're afraid that the poor and the middle will somehow take away what they have, and they try to convince everybody else who, even those who don't have much, that to be worried about any change, because the little you have, that'll be taken from you too. So we're full of tension and suspicion and trouble. And into that craziness, we throw police people. They grow up in the same tension-ridden society. They don't get the income. They don't get the training. They hear the message loud and clear. Your job is to keep the lid on this exploding society. Your job is to prevent all of those poor and middle-income people that we are constantly ripping off at the workplace, ripping off at the store, to keep them from saying, I don't want to be ripped off anymore. I want to be treated like a human being. I want to be given a reasonable share of the wealth I help to create when I work, etc. The cops are thrown into that situation, and they don't act well. Yeah, a lot of it's their own fault. They didn't have to take that job, and if they took it, they didn't have to be mean, nasty, vicious. No, they didn't have to do any of that. But I also want to stress, not by way of excusing anything, but by way of understanding, police are given a task nothing can achieve. That's why their situation is absurd and dangerous. Sure, they go overboard. Sure, they do excess force all the time because their job is impossible. No one should be asked to do that job. There shouldn't be the inequality, the unjust distribution of life opportunities, life chances for a home, for a car, for an educated family, and so on. Police can't fix the problem and they can't solve it. That's why throwing them at it is cruel for the population they abuse and cruel for the monsters those police must sooner or later become if they do not withdraw either from the police force or from the social role that is assigned to a police force. Here's a little parable to end the story. If you were a parent and you had two children and you took them to the park and you found an ice cream vendor at the park and you went over to the ice cream vendor and you ordered two ice cream cones and you gave them to one child, not, nothing to the other, you know what would happen. A wail would go up for the child denied. Sure, you could come later and make up some argument and try to snatch what was left of the second cone from the child who got both of them and say, you must give that to your brother, your sister. But of course, that will leave the brother or sister embittered. They only got what was left over, and there wasn't much of that either. What damage you do to your children if you behave that way? What lifelong traumas will they carry from having been so unfairly treated. Their relationship will be impossible. You will have destroyed that. And their bitterness will overflow into everything else in life. And if you beat the child who didn't get the ice cream to keep them from snatching it, you only make the problem worse. The obvious solution is you need a different system, one which would never allow one child to get both ice creams 
when the other one gets none. We will not solve the poverty problem, the racial problems of this country without a fundamental change in how we give people jobs, incomes, homes, automobiles, vacations, university educations, you name it. That's the social change that ought to come out of the courageous people reminding us that black lives matter, that equality is something we can continue to fight for, and that we need it because the alternative is a society no one will want long to live in. This is Richard Wolf for Wolf Responds from Democracy at Work for our Patreon community.